Welcome to Season 8 of Purposeful Empathy, a show that is dedicated to amplifying the voices of people from around the globe who understand the world needs more empathy and are doing something about it. Today's episode is brought to you by Grand Huron International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Thanks so much for watching. Enjoy the show. Welcome to a new episode of Purposeful Empathy. Today, I'm joined by the fabulous Michael Tennant, is an award-winning media advertising and nonprofit veteran who's worked for companies like MTV, Vice Media, P&G, Coca-Cola, and Google. Da, 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 da. He's also the founder of Curiosity Lab, a Black-owned hybrid product, entertainment, and consulting company that exists to build a massive community around the shared values of curiosity, inclusivity, and Empathy. Welcome to the show, Michael. Thank you, Anita. And just in the pre-call, I hope you don't mind my saying, I just discovered that you have a little baby on the way in a few weeks. So I'm so excited for you. By the time this comes out, she'll have been born. Welcome to the world. Um, I am delighted to to meet you because I am an owner of your product. But before we get into mm -hmm. all of that, why don't we just backtrack a bit? I read on yeah. your website um, that the tagline for the Curiosity Lab is, and I'm quoting, spreading curiosity, inclusivity, and empathy through storytelling experiences. Okay, so tell us more about this, you know, work that you do and why you do it and any kind of backstory that, uh, that sets us up to understand why. Yeah. Well, I'll say the big why is that we believe that people are working through their own realities of trauma and fear that keeps us from connecting to ourselves and to one another. It keeps us divided. And, you know, in 2018, actually, we're in America, we're approaching the midterm elections again. Uh, but in 2018, we we're approaching the midterm elections and we've done a values exercise alongside our our interns and we came up with empathy curiosity connection compassion and decided to to take on a mission together through that through that lens and we came up with divisiveness as the mission that we wanted to fight because we'd seen in our circles whether they were friends family members liberal or conservative they all uh had the energy of of fighting and divisiveness rather than of uh, understanding and curiosity. So um, today, through that moment and deciding to take on that mission and stumbling into a product, which was actually just a tactic in a campaign back then, but we created this product that ended up being quite sticky, a hundred of them, a hundred of actually curious, the conversation game sold out in a week. And We've just been following our, our values and the signs ever since. Ah, that's beautiful. And so tell us a little bit about these cards, actually curious. I'm the owner of, big, I think, three packs. I think now I, you mentioned you're coming out with a fifth. So how does it work? Yeah, so the original game that we made in 2018, which is the white deck, the actually curious curiosity edition, is based on the science and psychology of connection and trust building. The way it works is there are four colors with four unique eye shapes on the back. On the blue, questions like, I wish I could share blank with humankind. These are icebreakers. These are questions that should be easy to ask a stranger. So the eyes are closed uh, there to indicate that they're the lightest. When you go to green, the eyes open up a bit. You start to get into issues, your values, what's something that triggers fear in you and how does your body respond to fear? And yellow goes up a bit more and pink goes up a bit more. And so together in the original Curiosity Edition, you have a tool that allows you to meet people where they're at, start off light and to build up into more intimate questions as the group builds trust. So that was the original game. Uh, like I said, we made 100 and they sold out right away. But actually, as you get into that game, if some of your listeners uh, buy the Curiosity Edition, you'll find that some of the, the topics get pretty intense pretty quickly. So 
essentially every game that we have created since plays a strategic role in furthering empathy, lowering the bar, allowing, allowing people to feel more comfortable getting vulnerable or even to confront the really, really difficult conversations. So the second deck we released is the happy hour edition, which is kind of a cheeky way to get into in front of people who are looking for a party game and it's a great party game it's a great date night game but it also um it's it's based on the questions that help us explore what makes us happy naturally and um these questions really were important to my my own personal healing which we'll probably get into a bit as well the third game we did was the culture edition which was right before the election year and we wanted to have a game that met people at water cooler talk icebreakers around the culture the entertainment that we enjoy and then allows them to get comfortable before going into the more deep decks and then on the anniversary of the death of george floyd last memorial day we released the human rights edition which was curated alongside 50 thought leaders across different disciplines in, in human rights to make sure that we could really leave no topics on explore, especially for those of us who who really uh, consider ourselves empaths or consider ourselves on the front lines of these fights for inclusivity and mental well-being. Well, well, this is a tool that even helps us explore our edges and our biases and our areas of growth. So yeah, like you, like you mentioned ahead of time, we have been listening to our consumers. Um, Sadly, there is a rising mental health crisis in this country and in the world, and it's really affecting young people. There's a lot of pressure on young people. They spent a lot of time during the pandemic, uh, distance from normal social interactions, and it's having an effect on mental health. And so we took that charge and we're going to be releasing the Actually Curious Our Future edition which will be a tool that will allow young people to explore themselves, explore uh, growing up with their peers, but also a tool for the people that care for them and support them, the mentors, the parents, the teachers out there who want to see them really achieve their potential. It's amazing. Okay, so my mind is blown. Um, and I'm a user of your of your cards, so I know the impact that they can have, but maybe you could speak a little bit more to like who could use these cards and what impact have you seen as you've participated in some of these conversations? Because I see the application all over the place, but I imagine that, you know, I'm a believer, right? I I, I, I swim in empathy talk. So of course I understand yeah. how these could be useful, but speak to the cynic who's like, yeah, I'm not going to like share my soul to strangers or whatever. So what have you seen happen with them? Yeah. I love that you, you brought up that, uh, that, individual who has um, resistance towards this idea of a game that helps you build trust and empathy. You know, we've taken it upon ourselves to have empathy for that individual and to try to understand what their life experiences might be, what some of the fears or apprehensions or maybe even uh, some of the judgments or anger that might uh, be real for them. So we kind of take a perspective of radical empathy and compassion. We really believe that everyone has the capacity to deepen in empathy. So part of our, our mission, our way of showing up every day is, is believing in everyone. And so when we, uh, when we find those folks who are resistant to the game, then we really get curious about what we need to do, what we need to create to meet them. A universal truth that we work from is that we are all trying to do our best. We're trying to stay healthy and we're trying to be happy. And how we go about achieving that sometimes, you know, and safe. I got to say safe because before safety, it's even, it's really hard. That's, that's a bias that I've had to now that I've gone through my healing and I've been able to get out of debt. And now I'm, I'm on a, I'm chasing deeper enlightenment for myself. I have to remember before I had safety, before I had financial safety, I couldn't tackle this work. So safety is a big one. 
Um, just trying to understand where people are at and uh, and if we are true to our mission, how we can understand them and, and, and meet them. Um, maybe we don't have the product yet, but if we have the bandwidth and um, it seems like a good place for us to grow meaningfully without kind of detracting from the people who already believe in us, then then we're going to go there for sure. So I'm struck because this is the first time we're meeting by the sincerity by which you are communicating about this product. So, you know, you can hear Empathy's having a moment, right? I've been tracking, I've been posting daily Empathy posts for like nearly six years without missing a day. And the last 18 months has all been about like empathy in the workplace and empathy and leadership and empathy and culture. So you could have some empathy washers putting out a product to like, you know, but it sounds to me like this is so important and so meaningful to you and you've alluded to this trauma a couple of times so I don't know I don't know the story of I mean uh, you want to share yeah. yeah yeah no problem it's uh definitely a big part of my growth um in 2019 uh in July of 2019 I lost my older brother Chris um it was pretty devastating uh but it was also a a what I call my emotional rock bottom and a, a, a catalyst of change because at that time I had a cornucopia of unhealthy t uh, coping mechanisms. Um, being a workaholic, not the least among them, but also uh, I was in New York City, I was partying, I was, I was escaping in many different ways. But I realized actually when I lost Chris that if I'd continued going down that path, that I would I would have an early death. Chris was 47. But three months later, completely unrelated, uh, my brother Darren also passed away. And I had a bit of a different response to that because I'd had the three months where essentially I had channeled every mindfulness, um, every healthy coping mechanism I dabbled in over the last decade, I channeled that to heal from Chris. And those those uh, practices that I uh, really adopted with a dogmatic um, approach, those make up what would become the five phases of empathy. But when, when Darren passed away, I had what it would almost be, what I've come to understand as a productive trauma response. I realized that, you know, I now had a different role to play in, in my family as almost the patriarch in waiting. I had two parents who didn't expect to, who were in their seventies, didn't expect to lose their sons and eight nieces and nephews who are now without father. So, you know, at that point I decided that I really wanted to model the type of man that I could be for my family and for my nieces and nephews. And, you know, that came out in some different ways. I definitely created the capacity to show up more for my family to be there for what was a really difficult healing process. But also I started to invest in myself and my beliefs and my values. I actually got fired from my job right after that second bereavement leave, but I was ready for it. I was anchored in my values and I had the voice of my two brothers one who really believed in Actually Curious and had contributed to the Kickstarter and he shared it with his friends and he said, Mikey, this is, believe in this, keep going. But also a conversation with my brother, Darren, the second one who passed away, we had at times a confrontational relationship and we had a call where I was just kept retorting with questions till he surrendered. And this was not with a card game, but this was through the card game perhaps. Uh, and he said, okay, I get why you keep asking me these questions. And he said, and this was the first time that I even started to think about myself as someone who might have skills in holding space for people and, and helping people uh, have a gentle, compassionate partner in exploring where they want to go, where what they want to uncover or let go of. Because Darren said, hey, I think you have something. I understand what you're what you're getting at here with these questions. You can stop asking me questions now, and I want you to keep going. And that was just months before I lost it. So, um, 
yeah, after that loss and after all of that grief and, 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 and learning how to heal from it, I knew that this card game and the work that I had done, although I hadn't formalized it into the five phases of empathy, was going to have an impact in the world. And with the 2020 elections coming up, I decided to go out on a road trip and ask people to hear my story and to play the game. And at the end of that road trip, which was the beginning of the pandemic, the card game was in 75 stores from New York down to Florida and cr across to LA, uh, across the Southern border. So yeah, I would say grief had a lot to do with actually curious being where it is at this moment. I'm so sorry for your loss and for your family's loss. And I have never heard the phraseology productive mourning. Is that what you called it? Uh, productive trauma response. Productive trauma response. I've heard of post-traumatic growth, but that's, I'm so, I'm so sad that you had those losses. And I just feel that the work you do has so much purpose, especially since you hear the echoes of Chris and, 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 and Darren. Darren. Darren's yeah. voices yeah um thank you for sharing that sorry I wasn't I wasn't ready I think I, you had mentioned something about debt so I I made the false assumption that you were going to tell me a story about debt and I was kind of gathering my thoughts here um that's powerful that is so powerful and I can imagine because you know I teach um at McGill I teach undergrads and we do something called the public narrative which is um a tool that a guy at Harvard named Marshall Gantz developed. So he started his undergrad and then 30 years later came back and finished it because he was busy with the, like a bunch of different social movements. He, Mississippi boycott, uh, bus boycott, then the, the grape growers on strike in California and then the Obama 1.0 grassroots movement. Like he's a mass mobilization guy. And this, mm -hmm. the, the tool that he uses is called public narrative, which involves telling the story of self, story of us, story of now. Uh, which can be done in like three minutes, right? Where you share a little bit about yourself, you connect how we are the same and like, what can we do together? And it's a tool that, so I, I attended one of his workshops and then I use it in my classroom and, and you know, every student in the class gets up and tells a two to three minute story. And I talk about like, this is not a confessional where you are expected to air your dirty laundry or go to something traumatic, but this is also not a speech, this is something where you share a little of yourself and you show up in your authenticity and your vulnerability to the extent you want to. And it is the before and after class of the semester where students go there and mm -hmm. um, it's, it takes brave, it takes a brave and safe space. And so like just coming back to your card game, I imagine that when you've got the right safe space to do this, people are sharing and craving to share their stories, to be heard, to be seen, just to offer like a moment to just like sit with whatever's coming up. So have you seen some dialogues like, you know, like you've been astounded by the impact the card game can have? Yeah, I think, I think many, most of us want to be heard more than we know. Um, one of the first instances or anecdotes that helped me realize that I was headed in the right direction was when I was on this road trip. I believe I was in like Sarasota, Florida. I was at a metaphysical store and I was speaking to a wife and husband and there was a simple question in the blue level and the wife ended up telling a story about uh, just a memory from her days in Jersey and I was just paying attention to her physically and I had noticed literally as her hair rose and the skin on her uh, hand tightened into goosebumps and then mine did as well because I looked down at mine and I realized we were having the same physiological response and I didn't it, I went home and did research on uh, empathy and physiology after that but um, that was the first time I realized that just and she cried and we had just met and she said she hadn't thought about that in years. And this question had given her the safe space and the context, just being an unassuming question to tell a story. Uh, but the container, I guess, was 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 safe enough that she actually got to the the emotion that was underneath that story, which doesn't always happen in the first first couple goes of playing the game. 
Um, but we also do this, have done this work in uh, various sectors. So we now, um, 2021, we spent a large part of the year um, doing uh, heavily doing corporate workshops. Uh, we believe that um, we believe that empathy and the need for empathy is a total market issue, mainly because we all touch someone who works. And workplace culture has such toxicity, not only from the most egregious offenders, but sometimes just even embedded subtly in the culture, the culture of shame around needing rest, the culture of competition, um, rather than a culture of being in it together. I really loved what you shared about uh, doing empathy work alongside other empathy experts and, and on doing that programming that exists in us because we've come up in a society that competes. And so sometimes even for us, I think that there's there's conscious work to be done there. But um, we spent the large part of 2021 in organizations. We spent nine months at an adver advertising agency in Boston. We did work with, with NASA. We did work with Johns Hopkins Nursing. We did work with Stanford Psychology and their Alcove initiative uh, to install a youth mental wellness infrastructure in America. Um, and I guess what we found is a game, a game of questions can be a sneakily disarming yet powerful tool of healing, uh, regardless of where you're, you're coming at this from. And the reason why we have all of these levels and what we've learned over kind of bringing it into different settings is when to use what types of questions, how to meet people where they're at, or maybe to dial it back. Or sometimes we've made some mistakes even going too deep with, with, you know, there's sometimes there's what, what I call um, like the empathy hangover. I can sense it in the room and then I feel it and I have to learn how to, how to connect to what my intentions were and the purity of that and let go, <laughs> let go of the, the hangover of taking people too deep. Um, so yeah, it's once you play this game and it clicks from just being a game into a tool, then you're in for a, a lifespan of uh, witnessing um, just w witnessing people opening up and achieving breakthroughs through si a simple simple card game. And do you do any of this work online or is this all in person? We actually just before the election and in the, the beginning of the pandemic, we started doing virtual workshops every Sunday. We did it for 36 weeks. But like I said, I kind of, I got burnt out in June. <sighs> you know, I don't know if you noticed this up north, but it was almost like such a fervor for inclusivity work and empathy work that it was almost like an adrenaline pulling people forward. But around February last year, that started to taper off. Um, and in June, I started, I was just like, why am I, why am I banging my head against the wall here and not taking care of myself? So I had to actually start practicing greater self-empathy. Um, so we do uh, a lot of virtual, a lot of times we do the vir workshops virtual. We've had a wonderful opportunity to do more in person. We just did one in uh, at the Lincoln Field for the Lincoln Financial Group team, uh, marketing team, which was phenomenal to be in a setting like that doing this work that literally um, I was home healing and broke and just investing in, in our values, giving the game away via PDF. And I wrote the five phases of empathy then with the belief that one day I'd have the opportunity to be in the room with executives and take them through the five phases of empathy. And by the way, when we when we collectively got burnt out doing such a high volume of workshops, I channeled that energy. So I looked back at my values connected to myself and said, what, what, where do I go from here? And I decided to write a book proposal and I sold that book proposal at the end of the year. So it will be coming out in, in back to school 2023, as long as I stay on deadline. <laughs> Well, offline, if you want some uh, feedback on what my process was like, I, I, uh, I'm i happy to have that conversation. Congratulations. What's the title? The working title is The Power of Empathy. Beautiful. Beautiful. Love it.
Love it. Okay, yes, because it is super powerful. I think it's the second most powerful emotional force in the world after love. That's that's what I believe. Today's episode was brought to you by Grand Here and International, an on-demand coaching provider for individuals and companies. Um, you mentioned the five phases of empathy. Why don't you tell us what those are about? Okay, so the five phases of empathy is essentially the model that underpins our process of personal and organizational transformation through empathy. It starts inward with the person and strengthening greater self-awareness and ability to not only recognize, but to be with difficult emotions. Because what we find and we've touched on so much, but what we find is uh, many of us, whether it be in conversations, it be in relationships, uh, professional, romantic, otherwise, uh, even in taking care of our own finances or our health, have difficulty confronting or even recognizing where we've hit a block in our emotions that don't allow us to connect, to connect to ourselves and to connect to others. So that is the core foundational piece. It's rooted in somatic experiencing, uh, which was also a very key part of, of my healing. Um, and then it works its way out. So phase two is the importance of intention. It's using an anchor around values as a proxy to make sense of these emotional signals that we get naturally, that that superpower that we have that we, we really teach within our, our model. Um, and then how to channel that purpose into the circles that matter to you. So you're really investing your energy better and also learning uh, to strengthen your facility, maintaining your boundaries, knowing what those are and being comfortable expressing them. Right? And then seeing the ripple effect of that when you're saying no with greater ease, you're saying yes to the right places faster, uh, how that inf- unfolds with impact in the world, which I trust is some of the things that I'm going to see in your book when I read it. And finally, we talk about what living with abundance and starting to, since you're you're making these choices, you actually start to live a bit more with ease. You start to, I start to attract the Anitas in the world toward me who are values aligned, doing the same work. We can amplify one another uh, without it being so arduous. So in a way, that's the carrot that we, to your point, uh, when we get out of the card game and into the workshop world, that I try to get through to the naysayers, to the people who are really afraid is, look, yeah, this is about doing better in the world. But at the end of the day, even if you don't go there, this is about you being healthier, you being happier, you living with greater ease, greater connection to the people you care about most and anybody can benefit from that and as a result if everybody does that work the world does get better you know like i i um from biomimicry and sort of like just the natural environment we know that the most abundant resilient um flourishing bio environments are the ones that have the most diversity because if everyone is allowed to become, you know, their best plant, their best tree, their best root, their best mushroom, and they all live in the same ecosystem together, and everybody's got a role to play, and everybody's amplifying each other's like generative capacities, everything flourishes. So I, I think yeah. what you are writing and what you are working on is so important, and I'm sure it's going to be a very successful book. So that that is very very powerful. So. Um, Michael, I, I want to ask just a, a, a penultimate question before I get to the last one, um, <laughs> okay. which is like, what did you study? Like, what's your path before you becoming this thing? Like, I'm curious because I can't figure it out. <laughs> yeah, um, it's actually a question that used to give me a bit of fear answering ever since the New York Times dubbed me an empathy expert and I've conveniently taken it. Um, I studied economics and philosophy. That was my major. And I was a a media and advertising refugee. That's what I did. That's storytelling for brands. 
but really where the where it all crystallized or came full circle the philosophy work with the empathy the neuroscience is is after those losses so i really am autodidactic in terms of deepening my expertise in empathy um but i think i'm also coming from this perspective that i really want these tools to be in everyone's hands the reason why we're we're focusing now on young people is we think i didn't have tools of understanding the signs my body was telling me of what I like and what I don't like, what I'm afraid of, what I'm energized by, or even what my values were. I didn't have that till well in my 30s. Imagine young people growing up with those tools and the impact that they can create over a lifespan of living in alignment with their beliefs and their sense of their innate sense of safety and belonging. Hundred percent. I totally agree with you. Totally, totally. And they're craving it. They're craving it. They're craving the sense of belonging that, like, does transcend all the social media platforms. Because however connected they feel, uh, the real connection uh, is so uh, lacking. I, I, I sense. I've been teaching for like a decade, and I've seen it just kind of um, sharpen. So I love asking the question, Michael. Uh, to my guests at the end of our conversation and it has been so lovely to meet you and I'm so I'm so moved by you I also am always such a refreshing thing to speak to somebody who has a cadence that's much more thoughtful and slow than mine is and I'm always reminded like why don't I breathe more and just slow down Anita um so I just I just want to um recognize that and I appreciate that about you Michael thank you um can you think of a time in your life when you were on the receiving end of empathy, um, what I call purposeful empathy, where you you know somebody was there on purpose, you know, um, extending an empathic embrace, and what that meant for you? I was prepared for this question, but as you were answering it, just like a kaleidoscope of people and experiences have entered my head because there are so many and especially when you when you really start to focus on empathy for yourself and and how that can manifest for others then all you see is is those moments where 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 the human capacity for empathy shows up but the person who's been on my mind a lot of late is uh is a gentleman who I met actually through social media. Uh, I always like to think about this because we think about all the bad that social media does, but so social media is connected to me to some, especially as an introvert, to some really, some really wonderful people over the last uh, life, but also particularly over the last three years. But right after my brothers died, and I was trying to figure out whether people would believe in me and what I needed to share and uh, whether, you know, this calling of investing in, in individual well-being, well-being of Black men in particular, but starting to see how we as a, as a human species kind of are dealing with some of the same, the same uh, underlying traumas. I met a gentleman named Kevin Wilkinson. He is a coach, a psycho. He was a coach and psychotherapist, and I had, was seeing his messages on Instagram. He he's a black man, and at the time, I was really looking for someone who looked like me and sounded like me, who was doing this work, uh, who could help create that safe space for me to deepen and help me deepen in my own exploration. And I reached out to him cold, which I was always very afraid to do and would put many blocks around reaching out to someone and feeling worthy of their response. And I reached out to him. I told him what had happened to me and my family. And I told him what I was trying to do. And he agreed to meet with me. He coached me for over two years for free before everything started to turn around. But he died last June. He died of a massive stroke. 
So in a way, he almost like left me this other gift about helping people, but also making sure that you're taking care of yourself because he was so healthy and so thoughtful and intentional. But he must have been carrying a lot at the same time. But I just think about that kindness that he offered me and how much it helped me to to build a momentum of confidence and belief. Um, and so I'm going to be paying it forward. All of it. Thank you for sharing that story. He sounds like a really special guy. Yeah. And you are a philosopher at heart because the reflection that you bring to your lived experiences is really special um, and, and gives me, you know, uh, maybe I, I should reflect a little more as I'm going through life instead of acting, you know, like we're always like human beings instead of, I, I feel like more about human doing more often. Yeah. So this has been the gift to yeah. me. I also just want to share as a, like a little insight. Um, you were, you were nervous about contacting this guy, wondering if you're worthy. Uh, when I reached out to you, I was like, Oh, I wonder if he'll give me the time of day. Uh, I felt that about you, Michael. No joke. Uh, I was so excited when I, when you said yes. I mean, because you've been featured just about everywhere. You're kind of like in the big leagues. So um, thank you for making the time. Yeah, thank you for sharing that. I think um, I think we could all use to share that more often and to help each other have permission to go with what feels right. Yeah, yeah. What a great way to end our conversation. Michael, thank you. I'm sure this is not going to be the only conversation we have. I so look forward. Okay, and don't hang up when I hang up. Okay, we're staying on. But right now I'm going to say thank you to all our listeners and viewers. We'll see you next week at Purposeful Empathy. Thank you, Michael. What if you had access to your own council of coaches to help you break free of your thinking clutter, make that important decision, and liberate you from whatever is holding you back? At Grand Huron International, you get to choose the coach of your choice anytime from anywhere. Visit grandhuroninternational.ca and harness the power of on-demand coaching today.